Welcome to the 388th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I welcome Dr. William Lee, MD, author of the New York Times bestseller, Eat to Beat Disease, The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself. Just a reminder, you can usually catch COVID Calls live on weekdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. Also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. We're presently scheduling COVID calls into January, so we do value your suggestions. And as always, please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest of COVID calls. As of today, December 9th, 2021, there are 5,282,884 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. I've been reading an obituary or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. And in support of that today, I've actually put up a photograph because it's pretty essential to understanding this interesting story. The headline is Farmer's Tribute to Ant After COVID-19 Prevented Him from Attending Funeral. This was written by Daniela White and appeared August 25th, 2021 in the Sydney Morning Herald. In Jackson, a farmer from the New South Wales town of Gyra felt helpless when, <clears throat> excuse me, felt helpless when his much loved aunt died in Queensland and border closures meant he couldn't attend her funeral. Losing someone in these times is pretty tricky, Mr. Jackson said. I sort of felt a bit helpless, a bit stumped about how I could show my affection and love for my dear Auntie Deb came up with a touching way to honor her by getting his flock of sheep to form the shape of a heart on his farm. Sheep art has struck a chord with Australians who have had to come to terms with saying goodbye from afar as the COVID-19 pandemic keeps families separated. Border closures due to outbreaks mean people in New South Wales and Victoria are generally locked out of all other jurisdictions. Tens of thousands of people have viewed his video on Twitter after it was first shared by Mr. Jackson on his Instagram page. The video was played at Deb Cowdery's funeral alongside one of her favorite songs, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Jackson creates his sheep art by grain feeding the animals in specific patterns, and as luck would have it, he had some ewes almost ready for lambing that needed extra feed. I thought, I'll do a bit of sheep art for my Auntie Deb, he said. It seemed a particularly fitting tribute because she has always loved visiting the farm and hearing what he was getting up to, including his latest sheep creations. I just hope that what I, when I did it, Debbie took one eye off from having a yarn with her loved ones up there and looked down and saw my heart for her, he said. When the video played at her funeral, a torrent of tears came streaming down his face. Mr. Jackson said the truly difficult, the true difficulty of being separated from family by COVID-19 only hit home after his aunt's death. You hear about people doing it tough and not being able to say cheerio to their loved ones, and not being able to be there or have that type of connection that we're used to, Mr. Jackson said. You think that's tragic, but it can't happen to me. I'm not a grief expert, but certainly I was completely and utterly unprepared for how it's affected me, the family and others. Of course, there are so many people who are doing it tough in Australia and the world. The story is Farmer's Tribute to Ant After COVID-19 Prevented Him from Attending Funeral and appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald, August 25th, 2021. 
Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today, one I've been really looking forward to. Let me introduce my guest to you, Dr. William Lee. Dr. William M. Dr. William W. Lee, MD, is an internationally renowned physician, scientist, and author of the New York Times bestseller, How to Beat Disease, the New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself. His groundbreaking work has led to the development of more than 30 new medical treatments and impacts care for more than 70 diseases, including cancer, diabetes, blindness, heart disease, and obesity. His TED Talk, Can We Eat to Starve Cancer, has garnered more than 11 million views. Dr. Lee has been featured in various TV outlets as well as print outlets, including USA Today, Time Magazine, The Atlantic, and O Magazine. He's president and medical director of the Angiogenesis Foundation and is leading research into COVID-19. Dr. William Lee, thank you so much for joining me on COVID Calls today. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Knowles. So I'd like to start the way I generally do, just to find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation looks like there today. Well, I'm calling from Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, and uh, the pandemic, I think, uh, in Massachusetts uh, has been uh, re pretty representative of uh, many of the more heavily vaccinated uh, states uh, across the U.S. Uh, we do have actually hospitals that are filling up. Uh, so um, there's been uh, an anticipated surge. Um, uh, this is a really a hotbed for medical research, including COVID. And one of the things as a medical town uh, that, that Massachusetts has been able to do is really kind of staff up and prepare ahead of time. But that said, uh, you know, um, it is uh, wintertime in, uh, in, in this hemisphere. People are uh, uh, indoors. The, I think guard has been generally down. Uh, and so people are um, breathing each other's uh, uh, aerosolized contents and, and socializing. So that does make me concerned. Are you, you know, would you ascribe at this point any of the increase of people in hospitals there in Massachusetts um, to Omicron and to breakthrough cases, or is it too early to say so in, in Massachusetts? You know, Massachusetts is a great place to look at breakthrough, um, partly because uh, we attained a pretty high vaccination, uh, full rat vaccination rate pretty quickly. Uh, and, um, uh, and yes, I, I would say that the, the accumulation of cases that we're seeing now are, they, they, obviously there is a high level of, of, um, unvaccinated people that are getting hospitalized, but we're seeing breakthrough as well. Now, the thing about breakthrough, um, although we have recorded one or two Omicron, uh, cases, I think it's still primarily Delta. And uh, what I've been uh, really, uh, as a COVID researcher, what I've been telling people in looking at things is that, you know, where the story about Omicron is still unfolding. But what we do know for sure is that Delta can cause breakthrough, Delta can cause hospitalization. And so this is no time to let the guard down, but really to kind of um, uh, wise up and kind of continue to do the safe practice that we know that actually work. So it's interesting to me, the psychological impact of Omicron, which does seem to be driving people to getting boosters, which I think is a, is a positive thing. But from what I'm hearing from you is they need those boosters for Delta, not necessarily for Omicron. You know, I don't really care what it is that takes for people to get vaccinated and boosted. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if, if it takes a little Omicron uh, incentive, that's fine by me. Um, you know, I'm somebody who actually does perform vaccinations as a physician. I'm a, uh, I'm a big believer in uh, you know, getting uh, the the right preparation and, and vaccines are clearly uh, one of them. And boosters is, uh, you know, from the, all the data we've actually seen uh, is an important step forward. How would you account for, I'm going to use the word slowness, but maybe it's not appropriate, but it seems to be there's a slowness of uptake for for boosters among people who had already been fully vaccinated. Is it a messaging issue or is it somehow they're still in the window of time in which they think they're they're covered or their physicians are telling me it's probably multi-causal, but I'm curious to get your sense of it. Yeah, well, if you really think about it, most people who were early uh, to get fully vaccinated were vaccinated in the spring, uh, mid-spring of 2021, which means that they're way outside of the six-month window by now. And actually, you know, four to six months is that probably the time where immunity, vaccine immunity wanes. So um, now we're into December. So people that are fully vaccinated are may not be fully protected. And I think that that's actually a 
um, a subtlety that may not be clearly messaged enough, which is that even if you're fully vaccinated, you know, many restaurants and some stores and hotels are asking for your card to say that you're fully vaccinated. But that doesn't mean that you actually have adequate protection, both for yourself as well as your potential to spread um, Delta, I would say, to other people. Omicron is, uh, I think, still a story uh, in, in progress. Okay, so everyone who's listening, you heard it here. And Dr. Lee, uh, thank you for being so clear about that. And even my colleagues and uh, researchers who uh, you feel good about your vaccination status, but you're outside of that six month window, please go ahead and get that, get that booster. Um, so I'd like to ask you also, Dr. Lee, I've been asking guests for a while now if they'd share a personal memory of this pandemic time. And <clears throat> excuse me, it's, um, I know it's, it's kind of hard to focus on one, so don't constrain yourself, but I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing one. Sure. You know, um, I'll, I'll try to share a couple of narrative strands. Uh, uh, and that is, I went back to my, uh, my phone, my iPhone, and I looked back on my photo library, and I realized that in December of 2019, uh, I had already been following news stories because I had taken screenshots from news stories that suggested that there was some form of outbreak in Asia. And at the time, I remember distinctly thinking, wow, this might actually interfere with some of my travel plans or my work conferences that were going to happen in Asia. And I made a note of it, but, but didn't really think that it would ever strike at home uh, where I live uh, in the U.S., and then um, I had a, a family reunion that was being planned for my elderly uh, mom and her family. And uh, I had been a little concerned uh, about her flying to the Bay Area, which is where this event was to be held, because I thought, you know, maybe there's some small risk uh, of having passengers coming from Asia, uh, specifically from China, into the San Francisco airport, ASFO. Um, and I wanted to minimize the risk to my elderly mother. So we actually held her back and we decided that she would participate sort of virtually. Um, and that wound up obviously being a really um, prescient thing to do. But then the next kind of memory that I actually have was um, I, I had just finished a uh, a small workshop conference, uh, uh, conference workshop um, in Detroit. And I was uh, in a, um, a very straightforward, not a particularly nice hotel. And I uh, started to get the news feeds uh, on my phone alerting me that, you know, um, uh, Los Angeles airport had been shut down in terms of, of um, uh, incoming passengers. Uh, and these other reports that are really alarming started to come out. And I realized that some of this concern that I had been following before the WHO declared the pandemic um, were part of my own personal spidey sense. And then fast forward, uh, I had um, kind of brought my parents, my elderly parents into my home to bubble them in. Uh, and I sat probably like 99% of humanity uh, in the safety of my home, looking out the window, not really certain what was going to happen. And because I'm a medical doctor, I, you know, after a few days of this, I thought I felt compelled to do something. And so I remember I had two choices. One was to actually reach into my closet and pull out my white coat and suit up and go downtown and see if I could bail out some of my colleagues uh, in the emergency room or ICU, because I'm an internal medicine doc. So that's something I could naturally do. Um, and then upon further contemplation, I thought, you know, I'm a medical researcher and have been involved with very, very advanced research for cancer and diabetes and vision loss and Alzheimer's. And I thought, this is a, a, a new human disease. Perhaps my contribution could be better maybe more impactful if I actually applied um, sort of a little brain power and experience to trying to um, uh, decipher the mystery of COVID because there were many mysteries. We didn't understand uh, the proning for people in, uh, in, the, uh, in the ICU where you wouldn't put them on their back, you put them on their belly. We didn't understand the COVID toe. We didn't understand the weird blood clots. We didn't understand the strokes. And part of my day job 
is actually leaning forward forward into sort of unbeatable diseases and trying to figure out are there solutions based on understanding and so that's what i wound up doing and and because of some of the discoveries i made uh as a researcher that pulled me into sort of the center the eye of the hurricane so to speak well thank you for sharing both of those and or that 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 narrative strand as you say and um is it the first time you found yourself in a situation where as you said the you were kind of pulled in two directions, put on the suit up and actually go into the ICU and, and do your job there in the emergency department or go to the bench. I mean, in, in such an acute way, I mean, it seems the way you described it, it was, it was, it was a moment of decision for you. It was, you know, and, and, and I have to say, I, I, I can only think that this is a similar thought that hit many healthcare professionals, uh, which is, you know, what can we do to help? I mean, at a moment of, of, human crisis, not just global crisis, but ever, this is, you know, something that I don't think any of us ever expected, those of us who are trained in medicine, that there would be a new disease that would sweep around the world and affect all humans. And and, and now, of course, we know it's not just humans, but a whole variety of, of, right. of life forms as well. And, and so um, it was an odd feeling. And I'll tell you another, I'll give you another kind of uh, interesting perspective. <clears throat> Before I... Um, Went to medical school and throughout medical school, I was very interested in the, interested in studying the history of medicine. And the part of medicine I was most fascinated by is the transition between the Dark Ages and the Renaissance, which of course was not an overnight transition. It happened over hundreds of years. But um, in the study of it, you know, we went from a period of mysticism, superstition, uh, religious dogma to kind of a an era of scientific understanding. Uh, where there was a more deliberate uh, uh, effort to try to uh, decipher what was actually happening and, of course, a golden age of science and technology. And um, as I sat um, in my home behind a closed door, uh, not reluctant to go outside and not getting answers from the usual sources that I count on, and that's an important, you know, part of what I hope we'll discuss is, you know, the, the usual sources of authority that even doctors go to um, kind of were were um, were silent. Uh, and so uh, um, I what the image that came to my mind sitting in my home was that of a painting that I uh, have um, uh, sharply etched in my mind of of of. Um, of uh, 1630 in Venice during the Black Plague of Northern Italy, uh, where people, a group of women were huddled around a doctor wearing those big beaks, you know, the doctores right. man, filled right. with herbs and incense to thinking that the uh, odor would actually somehow protect the doctor. And these people clearly had fear in their faces and everybody was waiting inside their stone homes waiting for the town crier to say it was safe to go back into the village square again. And I thought, my God, 400 years later, here we are. And that was a, that was the image in my head thinking, and here we are again, you know, with this un ill defined disease causing a great deal of fear, including doctors that didn't have the answers. Mm. This was this, that, that painting really stood out. Um, and I've given lectures since, you know, showing that picture right. and, and, and sketching out the fact that, What's different today than, you know, during the, the the Middle Ages? What is different actually is that, you know, we do have the ability to communicate. We have the ability to do very, very uh, deep dives uh, in terms of uh, molecular and scientific understanding that didn't exist before. And we have this robust engine for innovation. And I would say that, you know, all three of these, um, the, the communication, uh, the deep dive scientifically, and the ability to fund and, and, and execute on innovation have been so far the, the, um, the, uh, the life rafts that have mm -hmm. been able to pull us uh, to where we are today. It's a powerful story and, and uh, anybody who's interested in the history of medicine uh, will take some satisfaction uh, as much as we can in this time that you reached for a historical uh, antecedent. And it, I find it really interesting too. I mean, I appreciate the ways that you distinguish that time from, from this time in terms of capacity, but you also describe the fear in the faces. And so there are some continuities and particularly, you know, you're describing a sort of moment where you're like looking to trusted sources and authorities 
and not finding them. And you didn't use the word fear describing yourself, but the, but surprise. Um, and I think fear, of course, in those months in February and March, April, for many Americans and people around the world, in which a world that they thought existed sort of sort of existed in some ways, but in others, the pillars of truth and confidence that they had in medical research and in elected officials to use that research wisely, those pillars were being kicked over. You know, that is so, uh, that is so true. Um, what I would, you know, I, I will, I will very, um, humbly and, and, and candidly say that, you know, yeah, I was afraid. I was afraid if not for myself, uh, then for other people that I care about, you know, my family, my friends, my community. And I'm somebody, by the way, who is used to dealing with, you know, really, really uh, uh, hopeless seeming diseases and leaning into that like cancer. You know, cancer doesn't scare me as much as COVID did back at the beginning of this pandemic. And so my, what I reached for was, and I think many of us did this, uh, particularly in research, um, I saw something quite amazing, which was this solidarity in the research community, people that were not working in COVID, that were, obviously nobody was working in COVID, but people who are not working in infectious diseases or public health or epidemiology. I mean, uh, I, I have a huge network of researchers in, in Europe and South America and Asia and North America, and we all came out of the woodwork to communicate with one another to say, what do you think? What do you think? Here's what I'm thinking. What are we seeing? Is there some way we can collaborate together? And that actually led to my contribution uh, to, to this, uh, to the to um, what hap what's happened in the last couple of, of uh, uh, years is that um, uh, I thought we have to uh, we have to scrape some understanding of this quickly. And so I had a research network and working with some of my research colleagues in Switzerland, Belgium, Germany, and the US, we were able to get autopsy tissue from people who died very early in the pandemic, died in the ICU, and we were able to get uh, use molecular imaging and what we call ultra path, ultra structural pathology. Um, so it's really a deep dive at the, and down to the genetic, genetic genomic level, um, molecular level. And uh, we looked at every organ and we found in the lung because we initially thought this was a respiratory disease. We were astounded to discover and have the first pictures of the coronavirus. And this is by the way, like March, April, uh, 2020, we were astounded uh, to discover that this respiratory virus was actually invading blood vessels, infecting the blood vessel cells, damaging the blood vessels and causing a vascular disease. And suddenly that was an area that, you know, that's my, that's my wheelhouse studying blood vessels. So I was able to pull on my resources to dig deeper. And what we've discovered since is COVID is not just a respiratory disease, it's a vascular disease and respiratory ailments affect the lung vascular disease actually affects every organ in the body because we've got 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels in our body. And a virus that actually gets into your circulation is perhaps the most uh, threatening form of virus of all. And so that actually galvanized me to start thinking as a vascular biologist, how do we understand this better? Is there a unifying theory to the organ damage that we're mm -hmm. seeing? Could this observation help us uh, un, uh, reveal clues for prevention, treatment? And then for long COVID or post-acute sequelae of COVID as the scientists call it, PASC, is there some way that we can actually have a better understanding and therefore a better treatment um, for long COVID as well? And that's really been, you know, I have to say that's been the unintended arc of my uh, career uh, during this pandemic. It's taken me into this whole realm that I never thought I would get into, which is infectious disease, uh, pandemics. And ironically, it boomeranged back into my wheelhouse, which is that, you know, I study blood vessels at the Angiogenesis Foundation. And here we are. COVID is, is an angiogenesis dependent disease. I just want to remind folks very quickly that you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking today with Dr. William Lee. And Dr. Lee, um, so I want to touch on all of those. And, and But I just want to go back a little bit, if you don't mind, um, and ask you a bit about your own training 
and sort of your own early you know days in in medicine and talk about what angiogenesis actually is and how you got interested and i know it's a little bit much to ask you to tell all of that story but maybe we could focus in on the moment um in which you knew you wanted to go into medicine and medical research and why this particular area was fascinating to you yeah, well, I grew up in a family where my father was a, a scientist and my mother was an artist who's a pianist. And so I've always grown up with this sort of right brain, left brain creativity and scientific uh, discipline and, next, and curiosity sort of firing in all cylinders. And so I went to medical school because um, I was really interested in, in both sides uh, uh, being applied to help people. Uh, and... Uh, you know, medicine is one of these, um, I would say, privileged professions where you have to, an individual who becomes a doctor has to sacrifice an enormous amount on a personal level, both in terms of years of commitment, um, uh, hours of, of, uh, of, of not uh, taking part in other things that most people, you know, in their 20s actually do for enjoyment in their life. And also financial sacrifice um, in terms of school debt and and you know um, not making a, a, a reasonable living I, I should say, but the incredible privilege uh, that I've always felt was this idea of being able to care for others uh, um, in ways that would be meaningful to their lives and, and to the community. So I have a I've always had a service kind of um, uh, motivation, and I've, I'm I'm also somebody who has always had a great sense of purpose, and if the purpose is really you know to try to address you know the diseases that scare you the most, um, whether it's heart disease or cancer or Alzheimer's or, you know, some like that's always been my thing is how do you how do we actually tackle the 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 the, the inky darkness that's out there? You know, cancer for, for many people has always been this frightening disease. It still is quite frightening, but we've made so much progress in it that at least to me, um, I, I just came back from last week from the um, Richard Nixon Presidential Library where they celebrated the uh, 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And I was invited to be on a distinguished, distinguished panel uh, where we were all reflecting on how far we've come over 50 years and where does that actually lead us into the future. And so, you know, um, uh, what I realized is that, you know, that my calling was not just to care for patients um, but really to try to um, unravel some of the mysteries that were unsolved. That's, a, you know, if I were, um, if I were in the uh, adventuring world, like extreme sports, I would say I do kind of extreme medicine as it relates to unsolved diseases. So to some extent, you know, I, I, I my own personality and the work I've actually done over the last 20 years was almost ironically perfectly suited to, um, uh, throw me into the the bonfire of this uh, pandemic, and and you know I think that we've made some uh, substantive uh, contributions. Uh, what let's talk about angiogenesis for a second. So, sure. when I went to medical school. I realized that you know most people don't realize this. When you go to medical school, what you're really doing is drinking from the fire hydrant four thousand years of Western medical knowledge, and they pack it in a way that you know you are truly. Uh, uh, not to continue the uh, the analogy in an untoward way, but you know we're sort of waterboarded with all this information, and if it doesn't kill you, you know you actually survive it, right. and and you and you actually have this huge amount of knowledge. That's knowledge of the past, and I, although I have been a huge fan, still am of history, uh, and I know like you're a historian, so uh, I, I I believe that the that there are huge lessons, important lessons from the past that can inform our present and future. Um, I've always been uh, most fascinated by what can we learn from the past to the present that will allow us to actually look at the dashboard of the future sure. and what's and you know to focus not so much on the rear view mirror, but to really look at the horizon line and to figure out how are we going to get there. And um, uh, so I was looking for exciting areas of research that were still nascent. Uh, but that had looked like they had tremendous transformative uh, potential. And so I um, uh, remember a paper that I read in college by a researcher named Dr. Judah Folkman, who was a surgeon at Harvard. Mm -hmm. and he was talking about blood vessels and how blood vessels were, in his mind, the key to cancer growth. 
but also the key to blindness and also the key to psoriasis and also the key to arthritis. And I thought that is the kind of thing that I want to study, common denominators of disease. Because imagine if you could actually pull, have a, identify a common denominator of disease, serious diseases. And then you, with that common denominator, you could pull the bow back and send a single arrow through multiple diseases. Imagine the kind of, of, of um, not incremental, but uh, leapfrogging progress that we could make that individual siloed research couldn't, de could not deliver. And uh, so that's why I studied angiogenesis. It was a thrilling time. I did it when I was a medical student, which is, by the way, for anybody who's interested in medicine, listen to your program or is in their medical training uh, as a medical student or a resident, I will tell you that uh, while you are in that learning formative period is one of the best times to dive into unknown fields or little known fields because you don't know enough to say no or to, you know, you have to suspend your disbelief. You just don't know enough. And so that's where I entered this um, budding field of angiogenesis. And it became, it ignited really the spirit of adventure that I always felt that I wanted to have. I wanted to seek out um, as a medical doctor. How could I actually dive in and make every day uh, un, you know, thrilling because I was discovering something new that could help um, my fellow humans. You are a powerful advocate for research, I have to say. <laughs> and then I think people listening who maybe haven't decided yet if they're going to go into medicine, particularly in these bleak times, need to hear more of these kind of stories of what you're talking about. Well, angiogenesis is the, is the formation of uh, vascular tissue, the formation of, it's, tell me, Tell me more about sort of some of the dynamics of the process and particularly, you know, as you mentioned, talking about the frontiers of that, the, the frontier, if you're doing it right, is constantly moving because you're catching up. And, and so what were a couple of the breakthrough moments in which you came to understand the process more clearly? And then let's bring it to COVID. Yeah. When I was doing my research training, uh, uh, what was uh, really uh, important was that I was not studying a disease. I was studying the process underlying multiple diseases. It's called basic research, but it had an applied component to it. Meaning, you know, I wasn't just studying the science for science sake, so it could be on the shelf in a the library. There was always this um, uh, excitement in the laboratory that we were all uh, unraveling something that could actually make a difference in in the lives of patients suffering from serious diseases. So every day was uh, was really kind of like a there was meaning to every single day, every single experiment we did, every paper we published. Um, but um, I would say my own personal eureka moment uh, when I was in the lab, I can remember crisply. We were um, implanting little polymer pellets that were loaded with um, essentially a uh, an extract from a ground up tumor. And at the time, nobody really knew what tumors were releasing. This is, you know, 30 some years ago. And so it was a big mystery. And we and you had to do microsurgery to implant these pellets. And it was within the cornea, which is like the crystal clear uh, face mm -hmm. of a watch. And we were and you know, we could only it was so precise, like a Swiss like Swiss watch making to be able to slide this little pellet in perfectly in the middle of all these layers. And I was watching, 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 and lo and behold, based on that implant, blood vessels started sprouting out from wow. the rim of the eye, coursing their way towards that tumor. And so for me, that was uh, in plain sight, what was happening to cancers in the, in the body. And so that was so eye-opening to me. I, I knew at that moment that it was, was going to be possible to one day develop treatments to be able to cut off that blood supply uh, that would prevent cancers from getting their nutrition, getting their oxygen supply, getting their blood supply. Uh, and, uh, and then the next experiment I did was to actually take one of what wound up being, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of experimental compounds and creating an eye drop and just putting an eye drop in. And I was astounded to see that something I was doing could cut off that blood supply and mm -hmm. prevent uh, with the tumor extract from getting blood vessels. And, you know, it was sort of this, um, you know, it had that thrill of victory, uh, you know, at the experimental level. And it, and it really ignited my passion 
for continuing the research and encouraging other people to do the research and sharing with other people as you know as as we're doing right now that you know uh, uh, these fundamentals and understanding how the body works is so profound in the right hands and uh, and they can really help people become the leaders of the future and by the way as a, as a um, as a footnote for um, your your listeners uh, dr. Knowles is uh, you know, um, here we are in 2021, right? Almost 2022. And, uh, we think we know quite a lot, uh, about the human body because what we've sequenced the human genome, you know, we've got the transcriptome. We've, we're starting to look at the microbiome. Well, I'll tell you, we're still develop, we're still discovering organs and new cell types in the human body, if you can believe it or not. Okay. Uh, uh, Earlier, this, uh, just a, just about a month ago, we discovered there's a new cell in the human heart, which is crazy that we wouldn't have known this before. Um, two years ago, we discovered a new brain cell called the rose hip neurons, probably connected to depression. Jeez, like that is so astounding that in this day and age, we wouldn't have figured that out before. Um, by the way, fat, adipose tissue, which is relevant to COVID um, as well, um, fat is now recognized as an organ in the body, not just something you want to get rid of. It actually has incredible hormonal functions uh, for functions. normal health. And then uh, about three or four months ago, there was a discovery about human metabolism that is rewriting the textbooks about metabolism. Um, all humans uh, from eight days old to 90 years old only go through four phases of metabolism. So it's not like you're born with a, a bad metabolism and my sister was born with a good one. Look at how skinny she is and look at how fat I am. Uh, poor me. Actually, every single human on this planet operates under the four, the same clock of the four phases of metabolism. And so it's our diet and lifestyle that actually can actually um, screw up our metabolism, not the other way around. So metabolism doesn't cause fat. Fat slows down metabolism. So again, you know, like drinking from this fire hose or right. this hydrant of new research discovery. I think that this is the kind of thing that COVID has taken efforts that have been long underway in research. And there's an opportunity to discover more about the human body, more about our immune system, more about our resiliency than, uh, than we have before. So the cup half full, I would say from this, the lessons of the pandemic is that, you know, we can take advantage of these unanticipated disasters uh, and leverage them to be able to do better for ourselves. Well, I wanted to also mention your book, How to Beat Disease, The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself. And it's connected to this angiogenesis research and your insight um, that there may be ways, that there are ways um, to prohibit red blood cell formation in tumors. And I don't want to get out of my depth here when I can very quickly. So I better let you explain that that connection and 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 i think that kind of an insight is one um and you've been very good at communicating it that i think feels very empowering to people because the word cancer of course is a terrifying word and it touches every family um and and so it's not some exotic concept it really does strike fear in people so then to give them some sort of tools some of them you're describing are ones which are very clinically sophisticated and others, if it's diet, does seem to empower people. So I, I'm sort of curious in how you took these discoveries at the bench and then became a communicator of those. So maybe talk a little bit about those insights and then also how you developed your skills as a communicator. Yeah, so uh, because of my work at the Angiogenesis Foundation, uh, that's a nonprofit that set itself up to really um, advance the frontiers of medicine by bringing the science into mainstream practice, right? So that when we started in 1994, there was no real angiogenesis treatments at all. It was really just an idea of vision. So, uh, you know, it's, it's almost a case study of nonprofits. You come up with this future idea and then you have to sort of chart the path to be able to get there. And, and We've been remarkably successful. I've been in, through the foundation. I've been involved with um, the successful development of 41 FDA approved treatments for cancer, complications of diabetes and vision loss 
And so um, previously untreatable diseases that would cause blindness are now eminently treatable. And, and the and angiogenesis targeting treatments, treatments that actually um, slow down or prevent the growth of blood vessels in the eye are the ones that actually uh, uh, are actually the ones that are uh, mainstream now. So to some extent, uh, the vision that we had at the very beginning, 26 years ago, has been realized. Um, well, you know, most nonprofits uh, in 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 healthcare or in health or in disease areas, you know, um, they dream of actually coming up with one successful treatment. We've had so many; uh, it's really been a, a windfall for us. Um, partly, by the way, I would say, uh, uh, Dr. Knowles is is really this. It's a proof of concept that this common denominator approach can really pay off. Uh, there is an economy of scale by focusing on commons. You know, like they they used to say, if you drain the Pacific Ocean, you'll see how all the islands are connected. And that's really kind of what we um, uh, tried to do. And I think that's a powerful way to actually approach medical research, to look for these commonalities. Now, um, after, you know, so many successful treatments that have been developed, I started realizing that there was a bigger opportunity, which is to use the same sites to prevent disease in the first place. And if you're going to talk about prevention, you really can't talk about drugs, expensive side effects, not readily accessible to everyone. You got to talk about something like food, which is safe, ubiquitous, accessible in some way to everyone. So I basically uh, decided to, to um, kind of crank the turret um, uh, uh, towards looking at disease prevention, including cancer, and to use the same tools for drug development to study food. So literally today you hear about this slogan or this term food is medicine. Um, I'm one of the people that actually really does study food in the right. same systems as medicine. And that's really what's led to the evidence base and the data and the generation of ideas that, that then turn into science fact. Just want to remind people that you're listening to COVID calls, and I'm talking to Dr. William Lee today. And I'm going to turn now, I think, to to talk, sort of bring that into the work you have ongoing right now about COVID. And you mentioned um, that you got to work right away in the spring of 2020, and in fact, you're a co-author of an article that was a, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in. Um, that appeared first in May of 2020, pulmonary vascular endotheliolitis thrombosis and angiogenesis in COVID-19. Uh, that was working fast, wasn't it? Tell us about the work. Well, uh, there were no COVID experts, but there were experts at the time in lots of different areas. Uh, endothelial cells are the cells lining blood vessels, and uh, uh, and we knew a lot about that. So the team that worked on this paper um, all basically went to their own toolboxes to bring out their best, uh, most sophisticated tools for analysis. So um, yeah, you're right. We It was you know faster research than uh, I think anyone's ever done before. We went from um, receiving tissue to making discoveries literally within weeks. And um, uh, but by the way, I think that this acceleration of progress under duress, which is what I think, you know, humans were a human society was under, uh, was repeated with vaccine development, you know, uh, and, and test development, frankly, you know, we had to do it. So we, you know, the triumph of the, of human ingenuity and commitment was to really to create these technologies, a perfect no. Although I have to say the mRNA vaccines are pretty damn good. Um, uh, uh, you know, could we do better? Absolutely. But the fact that we went from nothing to actually discovery and having technologies is truly, um, uh, I think, a mark of, of, the, of, of the human spirit, uh, but also of, of where we are with technology today. And of course, the ability to communicate by Zoom quickly, efficiently, to share information, to be able to do joint communications fast. You know, in the old days, and, and I'm not talking about just just before the pandemic, but I'm saying that even 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, researchers going on this stuff. I mean, we'd have to get on an airplane and fly and have a, you know, or, or an old school conference call. Like everything was fast, fast, fast with this. And there was a there was a feeling of purpose, like we had to get out what we found, what we discovered. So um, uh so what we discovered really is that um, this uh, the coronavirus actually invades blood vessels. That invasion of the blood vessels uh, is was horrifying to me, to be honest with you. And it was horrifying because 
most infections in the lung stay in the lung. And if they get into the bloodstream, that's sepsis. So that could spell mm -hmm. the end of you very quickly. Right, and right. that's the classic kind of the, the the classic paradigm in medicine. If you have a lung infection, you got to keep it in the lung. If it goes into the blood, you know, like now you're in real trouble. And yet this was even worse than the coronavirus leaking into the bloodstream. It was actually chewing into the cells lining blood vessels. Um, and 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 that that sheath of cells that line the blood vessels get everywhere, the brain, the heart, the limbs. And so when we actually looked in the heart, we found vascular damage in the heart. When we found, looked in the brain, we found vascular damage in the brain. Um, the testes, the same thing. The lymph nodes, the same thing. The liver, the same thing. And so the idea that uh, we needed to put, protect our blood vessels be, uh, became paramount. And, and that actually had direct clinical application. We were seeing people developing blood clots when they shouldn't, there's no reason for the blood, blood, blood clots in early in the pandemic. And people were scratching their heads when thinking about, should we thin their blood? Well, now we know if you're sick enough to go to the hospital, to be admitted to the hospital, you're going to get a blood thinner no matter what, because out of the discoveries that we made, including mine, uh, we know that, that, that the vascular invasion or the vascular damage, blood vessel damage caused by the uh, coronavirus will chew up the lining of the blood vessels and make them really sticky. So blood will want to clot to them. Microscopic mm -hmm. clots everywhere. So thinning the blood actually is protective of your health. So that's, you know, a really, really powerful uh, uh, tool. And then I was also involved with this discovery of other anti-cytokine treatments like baricitinib that wound up becoming approved uh, for the treatment uh, of hospitalized patients with COVID as well. So, you know, again, I think that this idea of discovery moving forward, trying to find an application to it is really, really important. Now you asked about my communication skills. Listen, I, I, um, I was invited to give a Ted talk in 20, 2010. And uh, that was a real privilege. And it was before Ted was so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the Ted main stage was this, uh, I mean, I had given hundreds literally of, of lectures, keynotes, grand rounds, you name it, at medical associations. But to speak on the main stage of TED in that little round circle in 2010 was sort of still the early days of, of TED, uh, of TED's digital program. Right. And I was there on a stage in uh, Long Beach, California, in the Opera House, standing on a dot with no podium, with Bill Gates in the audience, like right in front of me, you know, uh, uh, tweeting about what I was actually saying. It was a, uh, it was a, uh, it was a big deal for me, and uh, it also thrust me into uh, more of being a public figure because of how um, incredibly powerful TED Talks are and and how many people view them around the world, and so from that, you know, I wound up being invited to speak on various topics, uh, you know, on television, uh, daytime TV, news. Uh, cast. And I've, all, I've always done a lot of media work, but previously it had really been mostly print media. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, my work is complicated uh, and important uh, uh, in terms of health and disease, but people need to understand things really clearly. And so I, it's just something that I, um, I think is really important. And I make it my point to try to take complex things and digest them uh, help I'll digest it first and I'll try to find a way without dumbing it down to kind of serve it up to people in ways that they can understand. Oh, you're very good at it. And, and congratulations on that, that Ted talk, even I think it's appropriate to congratulate you even in more than 10 years later, because as you say, uh, people will work their whole lives and not get the opportunity to have a platform like that. And so you took advantage of it in a, in a, a powerful way, I think in a good way. And, um, and, and I want to sort of just linger on this for a second since you came back to the issue of communication because it's a bit of a double-edged sword right now with COVID because the things have been unfolding. I mean, as you say, it's a new virus. I mean, you were paying attention in December of 2019 and seeing signals coming from, you know, news that you might have been following in Asia, literally a new virus. And then within 90 days, it's around the world, probably sooner than that. Um and so science is unfolding at the speed of the news cycle, not usually the way things work. Every news desk around the world, reporters who'd been covering traffic are now covering science. And so 
that means that the hesitancies, the false starts, the mistakes, the blind alleys, and then the reshifts of science are also part of that. And I wonder what you've thought of, about that, and it's probably the first time in your career that your sort of every step as a researcher is is literally scrutinized in the in the daily you know in the daily news cycle, and and that has been I think for somebody like myself, I've been talking about this every day for you know since 2020. That's what I want to talk about. Others have looked at that and said, oh yeah, we'll you know science can't answer these things because look at all these mistakes, and they didn't know this, and they didn't they didn't know that. So I wonder, and the reason I put it this way is that when you take really complicated phenomena and you try to speak clearly about them to the public, you do have to uh, elide certain things. You can't talk about everything. And so that's put a lot of pressure on science communicators in this time. I'm, I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of Tony Fauci. I'm thinking of the many others who had to stand at the days in political situations sometimes and say uncomfortable things like we don't know yet, but we might know soon and we hope to. Yeah, no, I'm actually glad you brought that up. Uh, uh, Stuart Firestein is a professor of neuroscience uh, uh, at Columbia, and he uh, he also gave a really great TED talk once uh, about ignorance. And you know, when it comes to science, most people who are not scientists have an impression of scientists as being kind of brainiacs that know a ton of stuff and uh, uh, um, and kind of. Uh, they, they imagine the scientists get together and just, you know, um, uh, yammer about all the cool facts or stuff that they know. But in fact, it's quite different. People who are real scientists, when we actually get together, we spend all of our time talking about what we don't know and ruminating on the questions of our own ignorance, not in a, sh and not in a way that we're ashamed of it, but in fact, a way that actually prompts our uh, our own um, compass points to figure out what we want to look at next and sharing information. And so when it comes to this pandemic, what I would say is that I, I have been um, uh, working with uh, and, and be, being in touch with a global community of researchers, absorbing the research uh, that's been going on at a, at a really a furious pace. It's um, there's an exhilarate as a scientist, it's exhilarating because we're, we're seeing lots of things happening. And, and as somebody who's been involved with discovery, I uh, make it my business to really try to figure out not every discovery is meaningful. Uh, so to try to figure out what's important. And that's where my role as a doctor comes in. You said something that's actually quite, um, I think, profound. Uh, you made a statement about sort of science moving at the at the speed of the news cycle. What I would tell you is this. Um, science moves at the pace of science, and there's a lot of scientists cramming on this stuff, you know, day and night. The news cycle uh, is ubiquitous now. Uh, it's very fluid. It's 24-7. Because of media, the ability to communicate is, is completely fluid. It's boundaryless now. That doesn't mean that science moves at the speed of the news. At, of the news. What it means, and science moves at the speed of science, where I think that there is a disconnect Potentially, and and it may be a dangerous kind of counter poise on this is that, you know, it's it, it's people want to know so much about what's going on in science sometimes uh, before it's ready for prime time. So we don't have a conclusion yet. Uh, you never you don't need to know how the sausage is made. You know, wait for us to actually put the casing on it uh, when we're actually sure that it can be served up before getting back into the butcher shop. And, and so I think that that's really where a lot of the confusion comes because the scientists are also confused. We haven't put together the big picture yet. This is true for ivermectin. This is true for hydro hydroxychloroquine. You know, honestly, when you get everybody pouncing into it and weighing in and having public discourse, there's something good about public discourse about science. I think that it, you know, like it, you know, it's, there, there's good and bad. It's good for people to be, to be have a conversation about it. But I, I jokingly say everybody's become an expert on COVID because sure. everybody knows the terminology now. Everybody knows what an RT-PCR is. Everybody knows what a rapid antigen test is. But not everybody knows what the P or the C or the R stands for. Nobody knows. Not everybody knows what an antigen is. That's where you sort of need to leave it for the professionals. And so if I could give you an analogy where, you know, there's a serious business of homeland defense, uh, military, law enforcement, 
I mean, it requires discipline, training. You need to use know how to use your special weapons and tactics to be able to accomplish your thing. Now, if the average person took it upon themselves to pick up a weapon to be able to defend their homeland, now you're talking about vigilanteism. And I think that that's where the risk is, is, you know, with everybody pouncing in mm -hmm. where it does, in fact, seem like science is moving at the speed of the news cycle, but everybody becomes a uh, armchair scientist that can, and then it becomes political. And right. then you can actually start to uh, um, uh, create more confusion than clarity. And for me as a communicator, it's always about clarity. So when I had something to say in the media on CNN or ABC uh, or GMA or whatever it is, I only took those opportunities where there was something clear that I, and important and timely that I wanted to communicate that could actually have an impact to the public. So um, I've actually turned down plenty of opportunities to right. get on to talk about stuff because I'm not interested in talking about stuff. I would only want to communicate about important things. Uh, that's, uh, I think, what people have uh, come to term staying in your lane in, in medical disciplines. And uh, it is striking how many instant epidemiologists have been created throughout this pandemic. And I, and I, I think it takes a lot of restraint, frankly, and I appreciate what you're saying, because once you are somebody who's in the pages of the New York Times, and this is true for all specialists, and I don't blame journalists for this, they're working on a deadline. But once you're one of those people who's a trusted authority, they'll pull you for almost any topic. <laughs> And so it does take a, that sort of willingness to say, not me, but this other person on this on this issue. And you must field calls like that all the time. Precisely. Precisely. Very important. I mean, you know, and, and I think at the uh, at the start of the hour, you were talking about, you know, Omicron. And, and you know, it's it's interesting. I think it's so responsible for South Africa that had this capability to be able to discover and communicate about a new variant of concern. It was also incredibly responsible for the World Health Organization to be able to actually um, uh, sound the alarm of a variant of concern. And I think the CDC to be able to actually also uh, pay attention and communicate about it. So those are, you know, the lighthouses all uh, spinning their uh, lanterns um, uh, in the way that they're designed to do. I think that the um, fear and panic and the uh, kind of responses that have happened now uh, are to, to Omicron, like we still don't really understand what's actually happening. If anything, uh, I would say that as, as things are unfolding in real time, perhaps there's a chance that this new variant might be less disease causing than we thought, certainly less than Delta. And that, that to me seems pretty clear to me. So can we, um, uh, how do we communicate about that? And, you know, there's lockdowns everywhere. You know, if people wound up getting vaccinated and boosted and wear masks, social distance, take care. I mean, the thing that, you know, we'll, we'll be pretty safe. And what I'm actually most concerned about right now um, is the fact that, um, you know, they call it pan pandemic fatigue. You know, we're never, we're never tired of slowing our car to stop at a stop sign. We're never tired of staying within the speed limit. Right now, we're just sort of accepting this reality of humans on planet Earth. We got to deal with this pandemic and we got to deal with COVID. And so I think that taking those measures that we know work, vaccines, boosters, masking, distancing, wash, hand washing, and use exercising the best possible judgment uh, that we can is going to keep all of us safe. And what concerns me is actually seeing people saying it's the holidays. Let's get, get back together. Finally, I'm fully vaccinated. You might be fully vaccinated, but you might not be fully protected. And so there is ongoing messaging that needs to happen. So we're almost up on, uh, on time in my conversation today on COVID calls with Dr. William Lee. And I just wanted to ask you one more question, Dr. Lee, back to the research that you've been doing on COVID. So what are some of the insights that doctors are having in the COVID research that you think is then going to turn into important findings in other fields of medicine? I mean, you talked about COVID as a virus that you literally, you had this aha moment that it's discovered that it's affecting every system uh, that's in the bloodstream. And so therefore it's, it's going well beyond the lungs potentially. I mean, that's terrifying to hear you say that, but then that also makes me think back to your common denominator concept that this might provide insights into other areas of medical research. Yeah, well, I'll point out a couple. First, we know that uh, what, what we, I think what we're seeing with COVID, which is 
um, an acute infection, most people recover from, but some wind up actually having this sort of long tail that can be um, quite uncomfortable or disabling or even crippling, uh, 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 helps us understand other diseases that this can happen in as well, like Lyme disease, like uh, uh, shingles, uh, like chronic fatigue. Um, and so we may actually wind up discovering having insights that can help other diseases that we know um, we've been dogged by, by, by a lack of understanding what's actually happening. Now, there's three things that, are, that we believe are happening in long COVID that are kind of the, this, in this long tail of the disease that could be really, really important to keep an eye on. One is that there's this damage to small blood vessels, microvascular damage. Number two, there's chronic low-grade inflammation that's probably partly autoimmune. And number three, there's damage to nerves, neuropathies, the tiny little nerves, okay? And this can, these three things can, these three legs of the stool at the molecular level can explain almost every single um, complication that we see in long COVID. Uh, and so here's some interesting questions and profound questions to ask. Um, is that vascular damage, uh, uh, is that gonna set up or that inflammation set up people at greater risk for cancer in 10 years or 20 years. They might have recovered from COVID now, but maybe there's this sort of like smoldering fire going on that's going to just start to trigger off little microscopic cancer cells. So I've had this conversation with oncology wow. leaders and we're asking, we're, we're, we haven't studied it yet, but we're really asking this question. What about, um, I mean, we know that from acute COVID that there are some people that never had diabetes. They get COVID, they become diabetic. So now you're killing off your insulin creating cells. Um, if, is that, are there other diseases that could be triggered later on? Even if you've recovered from COVID, we don't know that, but we need to watch out for that because, you know, of the, um, I mean, there's something like, uh, if, you, if you take a, a roughly about a third of people who have had COVID recovered, survived COVID and recovered from it, about a third of people um, uh, wind up developing some form of long COVID. Uh, that's about 70 million people worldwide. Okay. Yeah. Now imagine that, you know, COVID, the, the long tail of COVID winding becoming another chronic disease that we're ill prepared to deal with. And so I think that um, there, you know, you're asking about the cross fertilization. I think that there are lots of things for immune system we're learning, but I'm looking at sort of this um, uh, forward looking, uh, 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 I would say, red flag for us, you know, yeah, I had COVID. I recovered. I'm, I'm fine. You know, I don't need, I don't care. I'm already immune. Not so I like from everything that I'm seeing, the reason I am as a researcher and as a physician, so careful about my own personal behaviors and the, and, and what, how I advise my family and my friends and my colleagues is because I've seen what this disease can do at the microscopic level. And because there are things that we never expected, a simple virus to be able to do, it makes me want to encourage people to be much more careful because what we uh, can't see could hurt us. And that's the best argument I can make um, uh, to why get vaccinated, get boosted, and do those simple PPE types of things um, to be able to you know, get us through to the future. I just want to remind everyone that you've been listening to COVID calls and you can usually catch COVID calls live at 6 p.m. Eastern time. It's been a really powerful week of conversations on COVID calls, and I can't think of a better way to end it than my conversation with Dr. William Lee, the author of Eat to Beat Disease, The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself, and, and also a leading COVID researcher and long COVID researcher. Dr. Lee, uh, a pleasure to speak with you. I learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time and generosity today of time. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Knowles. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you next time on COVID Calls.